the Mississippi River. Table of Contents, the Mississippi River. All about the Mississippi River. With visiting and touring information. Geography. History. Attractions. And other points of interest. Dr. Sidney Soclough. Dr. Sydney 22 at gmail.com. 2023. Narration by Dr. Sidney Soclough. Zoe Phonemes. And Nathan Cole Tove. For a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.one slash YT Navigator. The Mississippi River. This shows the Mississippi River and its many tributaries. This is a map of the watershed of the Mississippi Missouri River system. This illustrates some common features of rivers. This is a representative profile of a river from the source to the mouth of the river. This shows the typical profile of a river from its source to the sea or ocean. This shows the typical longitudinal and cross-sectional profiles of a river. As the gradient decreases, there is a greater amount of meandering of a river. This shows the erosion and deposition process that leads to the bending and meandering of a river. As the bending of a river increases, there often is the cutting off of a bend leaving behind an isolated oxbow lake. We will next have a short video clip of why do rivers curve. Compared to the white water streams that tumble down mountainsides, the meandering rivers of the plains may seem tame and lazy. But mountain streams are corralled by the steep walled valleys they carve. Their courses are literally set in stone. Out on the open plains, those stony walls give way to soft soil, allowing rivers to shift their banks and set their own ever-changing courses to the sea. Courses that almost never run straight. At least not for long, because all it takes to turn a straight stretch of river into a bendy one is a little disturbance and a lot of time. And in nature, there's plenty of both. Say, for example, that a muskrat burrows herself a den in one bank of a stream. Her tunnels make for a cozy home, but they also weaken the bank, which eventually begins to crumble and slump into the stream. Water rushes into the newly formed hollow, sweeping away loose dirt and making the hollow even hollower, which lets the water rush a little faster and sweep away a little more dirt, and so on and so on. As more of the stream's flow is diverted into the deepening hole on one bank and away from the other side of the channel, the flow there weakens and slows. And since slow-moving water can't carry the sand-sized particles that fast-moving water can, the dirt drops to the bottom and builds up to make the water there even shallower and slower, and then keeps accumulating until it becomes new land on the inside bank. Meanwhile, the fast-moving water near the outside bank sweeps out of the curve with enough momentum to carry it across the channel and slam it into the other side, where it starts to carve another curve, and then another, and then another, and then another. The wider the stream, the longer it takes the slingshotting current to reach the other side, and the greater the downstream distance to the next curve. In fact, measurements of meandering streams all over the world reveal a strikingly regular pattern. The length of one S-shaped meander tends to be about six times the width of the channel. So little tiny meandering streams tend to look just like miniature versions of their bigger relatives. As long as nothing gets in the way of a river's meandering, its curves will continue to grow curvier and curvier until they loop around and bumble into themselves. When that happens, the river's channel follows the straighter path downhill, leaving behind a crescent-shaped remnant called an oxbow lake. Or a billabong. Or un lago en herradura. Ou un bras mort. We have lots of names for these lakes, since they can occur pretty much anywhere liquid flows, or used to. Which brings up an interesting question. What do the Martians call them? At the mouth of a river, where it enters a much larger body of water such as a lake, bay, gulf, or ocean, the speed of the water decreases. This causes the increased deposition of silt, resulting in the formation of a delta and distributaries. The gradient near the beginning of the Mississippi River is about 2.2 feet per mile, or a slope of 0.04%.
while the gradient of the river near the end of the Mississippi River is only 0.37 feet per mile, or a slope of a minute 0.007 percent. Chapter 3 Much of the present lower Mississippi River Valley was once water, as a bay of the Gulf of Mexico, extending almost up to the junction of the Ohio River at Cairo, Illinois. The Mississippi Embayment stretches from central Louisiana into southern Missouri. It is now essentially a continuation of the sedimentary deposits that form the Mississippi River Delta, northward to the confluence with the Ohio River. This is the vast Mississippi-Missouri-Ohio River drainage basin. The Mississippi-Missouri-Ohio River system drains 41% of the 48 contiguous states of the U.S. This is an animation of the flows along the rivers of the Mississippi watershed. The Mississippi-Missouri-Ohio River system has the fourth largest drainage basin in the world. Exceeded in size only by the watersheds of the Amazon, Congo, and Nile rivers. The Mississippi Missouri Ohio River system drains an area of about 1.2 million square miles, 3.2 million square kilometers, including all or parts of 32 states and two Canadian provinces. This is about 40% of the continental U.S. The Mississippi-Missouri-Ohio watershed is the fourth largest in the world, extending from the Allegheny Mountains in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the west. This is an area of 1.2 million square miles as compared to the Amazon, which drains 2.7 million square miles. This shows the major drainage basins of the Mississippi-Missouri River system. This shows the contributions of the major rivers of the Mississippi-Missouri River system. We see that the Ohio River is a major contributor. We also note that the substantial distributary is the Atchafalaya River. The Mississippi River is the 15th largest river in the world by discharge volume. However, this flow is a small fraction of the output of the Amazon. On average, the Mississippi has only 8% of the flow of the Amazon River. The Mississippi-Missouri River system measures almost 4,000 miles long, making it the fourth longest in the world. However, the Mississippi River itself is 2,320 miles long, although the Missouri River is actually much longer than the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River is the second longest river in North America flowing 2,350 miles from its source at Lake Itasca, through the center of the continental U.S., to the Gulf of Mexico. The Missouri River, a tributary of the Mississippi River, is about 100 miles longer. Some describe the Mississippi River as being the third longest river system in the world if the length of the Missouri and Ohio rivers are added to the Mississippi's main stem. At Lake Itasca, at the source of the Mississippi River, the river is between 20 and 30 feet wide, the narrowest stretch for its entire length. The widest part of the Mississippi River can be found at Lake Winnebagoshish near Bena, Minnesota where it is wider than 11 miles. The widest navigable section in the shipping channel of the Mississippi is Lake Pepin, where the channel is approximately 2 miles wide. This is Lake Pepin, where the channel of the Mississippi River is approximately 2 miles wide. This is Lake Pepin in Minnesota. The Mississippi River is the 15th largest river in the world by volume. However, this flow is a small fraction of the output of the Amazon. On the average, the Mississippi has only 8% of the flow of the Amazon River. At Lake Itasca, the average flow rate is 6 cubic feet per second. At Upper St. Anthony Falls in Minneapolis, the northernmost lock and dam, 
the average flow rate is 12,000 cubic feet per second or 89,869 gallons per second. At New Orleans the average flow rate is 600,000 cubic feet per second. At the headwaters of the Mississippi, the average surface speed of the water is about 1.2 miles per hour, roughly one half as fast as people walk. At New Orleans the river flows at about 3 miles per hour. But the speed changes as water levels rise or fall and where the river widens, narrows, becomes shallower, or some combination of these factors. It takes about three months for the water that leaves Lake Itasca, the river's source, to reach the Gulf of Mexico. From its source at Lake Itasca to the Gulf of Mexico, the Mississippi River drops a total of 447 meters. From Lake Itasca to Minneapolis-St. Paul, the drop is 219 meters or almost half of the total. The drop on the Middle and Lower Mississippi River from St. Louis to the Gulf is 119 meters or just 27% of the total. And from Memphis to the Gulf is only 14% of the total. The U.S. has 25,000 miles of inland waterways and includes a total of 239 locks to form the nation's water highway. This system is operated and maintained by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, supports more than half a million jobs, and delivers more than 600 million tons of cargo each year, representing 14% of all domestic freight. Much of the commercially important waterways of the U.S. consist of the Mississippi River System, the Mississippi, Missouri, and Ohio Rivers, and the connecting waterways. This shows that the busiest waterways are the Mississippi and Ohio Rivers, with the Illinois, and sections of the Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Red Rivers also being important. Inland waterways are vital to the U.S. agriculture industry, as 60% of grain exports are moved by barge in the energy sector. More than 22% of domestic petroleum and petroleum products, and 20% of coal used to generate electricity are moved on the inland waterways. This shows the major inland and lake and ocean ports of the U.S. Note these ports are on the Mississippi-Missouri-Ohio River system. To move goods up and down the Mississippi, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers maintains a nine-foot shipping channel from Minneapolis to Baton Rouge. From Baton Rouge past New Orleans to Head of Passes, a 45-foot channel is maintained to allow ocean-going vessels access to ports between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. The three largest metropolitan areas on the Mississippi River are Minneapolis-St. Paul at 4 million, St. Louis at 3 million, Memphis at 1.3 million, and New Orleans with 1.2 million. An important link in the inland waterways of the U.S. is from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico. This connects Lake Michigan to the Mississippi River via the Illinois Waterway. The Illinois Waterway system provides a navigable link from the Atlantic Ocean via the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great Lakes to the heartland of the U.S. and the Gulf of Mexico. The Illinois Waterway provides a shipping connection from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico via the Illinois and Mississippi Rivers. The Illinois Waterway is a system of rivers, lakes, and canals that consists of 336 miles, 541 kilometers, of waterways from the mouth of the Calumet River near Chicago and Lake Michigan to the junction of the Illinois and Mississippi Rivers at Grafton, Illinois. This illustrates the drop of the Illinois Waterway from 578 feet, 176 m, above sea level at Lake Michigan to 419 feet, 128 m, at the Mississippi River at Grafton, Illinois. There are eight locks and dams on the waterway. The Bays Plains River, which flows into the Illinois River of the Mississippi River Basin, is very close to the shores of Lake Michigan near Chicago and the Great Lakes Basin. 
This is a map and profile of the Illinois Waterway from the Mississippi River to Lake Michigan near Chicago. This is the Illinois and Michigan Canal that connects the Illinois River to Lake Michigan near Chicago. The canal opened in 1848. In 1900, the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal replaced it and reversed the flow of the Chicago River, so it no longer flowed into Lake Michigan. The United States Army Corps of Engineers maintains a 9-foot deep navigation channel in the waterway. Chapter 6 Except for ocean freight, the river barge is the most cost-effective and environmentally responsible mode of transport. One river barge carrying 1,500 tons carries the same weight as 15 large hopper-type rail cars or 58 large semi-trucks. One toll of 15 river barges carrying 22,500 tons carries the same weight as 2.25 railroad trains, each 100 cars long, or 870 large semi-trucks. One tow of 15 river barges extends one quarter of a mile. To carry the same weight would require 2.25 trains each 100 cars long and extending a total distance of almost three miles. Being the most cost-effective and environmentally responsible mode of transportation, river barges can move one ton of cargo on one gallon of fuel a distance of 514 miles. This compares to 202 miles by train, and only 59 miles by truck. Transportation by river barges produces much less environmental pollution than by train or truck. The efficiency of river barge transportation is true for both dry cargo, and even more so for liquid cargo. A record was set in 1981 with a tow of 72 barges pushed upriver on the Mississippi River from Louisiana to Kentucky. This tow of 72 barges pushed upriver on the Mississippi River from Louisiana to Kentucky carried the same weight as 1,080 large hopper-type rail cars, or 4,176 large semi-trucks. A record was set in 1981. With a tow of 72 barges pushed upriver on the Mississippi River from Louisiana to Kentucky. This shows the entire course of the Mississippi River. From the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul all of the way down to New Orleans. This is the Mississippi River. Showing principal ports from the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul all of the way down to New Orleans. This is the lower Mississippi River showing principal ports from Memphis down to New Orleans. This is the Upper Mississippi River, showing principal ports from the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul down to Alton, Illinois and St. Louis, Missouri. This tow of 72 barges pushed up river on the Mississippi River from Louisiana to Kentucky carried the same weight as 1,080 large hopper-type rail cars, or 4,176 large semi-trucks. The ports of New Orleans, South Louisiana, and Baton Rouge cover a total distance of 172 miles on both banks of the Mississippi River. These three ports are significant to the economy of the nation. The ports of South Louisiana, New Orleans, and Baton Rouge rank third, fourth, and fifteenth, respectively, in total trade by port to all world ports. In terms of dollar value, total trade by port to all world ports, New Orleans, South Louisiana, and Baton Rouge rank 12th, 16th, and 27th, respectively. These three ports serve as a gateway for nearly 55 to 70 percent of all U.S. exports of corn, soy, and wheat. Barges carry grain shipments from the Midwest to the ports for storage and export, handling 60% of all raw grain exports. The port of South Louisiana may not be the busiest container port in the U.S., but it is easily the nation's busiest by tonnage. The port ranks above the ports of Houston, New York, New Jersey, New Orleans, Beaumont, Corpus Christi, 
Long Beach, Greater Baton, Rouge, Los Angeles, and mobile for weight of cargo handling. The Port of South Louisiana is the only port in the U.S. that ranks in the top 20 worldwide. It is also the nation's largest port for grain exports and its biggest port by import values, handling about $70 billion per year of inbound cargo. The Port of South Louisiana extends 54 miles along the Mississippi River between New Orleans, Louisiana and Baton Rouge centering approximately at Laplace which serves as the port's headquarters location. The highest tonnage exports from these ports are grain, 34%, Crude oil, 24%. Petrochemicals, 19%. Chemicals and fertilizers, 7%. And coal, 7%. Imports include steel, rubber, coffee, fruits, and vegetables. The Port of South Louisiana consistently ranks above the ports of Houston, New York, New Jersey, New Orleans, Beaumont, Corpus Christi, Long Beach, Greater Baton, Rouge, Los Angeles, and Mobile, making it the largest tonnage port in the Western Hemisphere. The Port of South Louisiana is ranked 16th in the world. Of the nearly 5,000 ports, the Port of South Louisiana is the only U.S. port that ranks in the top 20 ports in the world. This shows the tonnage, both domestic and foreign, handled by the leading U.S. ports. Container traffic is usually measured in twos, or 20-foot equivalent units. A typical 18-wheeler semi-truck hauls a 40-feet container, which is two twos. These are the busiest container ports in the U.S. by two throughput. We see that although the Louisiana ports lead in terms of bulk cargo, they certainly are not high on the list in terms of container cargo, with New Orleans being the only international container port. This shows the container ports in the U.S. by two throughput in 2010. This shows the container ports in the southeastern U.S. by two throughput in 2010. In international commerce, about 5,000 ocean-going vessels dock at New Orleans annually, and more than 40 nations have consular offices in the city. About 6,000 vessels pass through the port of New Orleans annually. New Orleans is also a busy cruise port both in terms of river cruises as well as ocean cruises. New Orleans ranks 25th in the world, with slightly over 1 million cruise ship passengers annually. New Orleans is an important port for river cruises, with boats of the American Queen Steamboat Company and the American Cruise Lines offering cruises up the Mississippi River to Memphis, and even all of the way up to Minneapolis-St. Paul. The port of Greater Baton Rouge is the 10th largest in the U.S. in terms of tonnage shipped, and is the farthest upstream Mississippi River port capable of handling Panamax ships. The status of Baton Rouge as a major port city, and being the farthest upstream Mississippi River port capable of large ocean-going ships is largely due to the Huey P. Long, OK, Allen Bridge. The Huey P. Long. OK. Allen Bridge was intentionally constructed at a low height under the governorship of Huey Long to prevent big tankers from making their way upriver past Baton Rouge. The Huey P. Long, OK. Allen Bridge is a truss cantilever bridge over the Mississippi River carrying US 190, airline highway, and one rail line between East Baton Rouge Parish and West Baton Rouge Parish in Louisiana. Although the bridge is named after former Louisiana Governors Huey P. Long and Oscar K. Allen, it is known locally in the Baton Rouge area as the Old Bridge. These are the Melvin Price Locks and Dam, also known as Lock and Dam No. 26, on the Mississippi River at Alton, Illinois, 22 miles north of St. Louis.
The upper Mississippi River is controlled by 29 locks and dams that stretch from the Twin Cities to St. Louis as the river drops in elevation, by more than 400 feet. There are no locks or dams on the Mississippi River below St. Louis. The river travels at 1.2 to 3 miles per hour and is approximately 2,350 miles long. The locks and dams on the Mississippi River are numbered downstream from north to south, with the exception of the upper St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam, followed a short distance downstream by the lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam. The upper Mississippi Lock and Dam system is called the Stairway of Water. The elevation above sea level is shown on the left. This shows the upper and lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam at Minneapolis-St. Paul, followed by Lock and Dams number 1 through 27 near St. Louis. This is the upper Mississippi Lock and Dam system from the upper and lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam at Minneapolis-St. Paul to Clinton, Iowa, a distance of 400 miles. Most of the locks and dams were built in the 1930s, and designed to last 50 years. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is facing a backlog in maintenance of more than $1 billion. The first of the locks and dams on the Mississippi River is the Upper St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam. The following lock and dam sets are numbered going downstream, beginning with Lock and Dam 1 just below Minneapolis St. Paul. They continue downstream to the last lock. Lock 27, just above St. Louis at Granite City, Illinois. Lock 27 moves more cargo than any other navigation structure on the Mississippi River. The structure is situated near the southern end of the 8.4 mile long, man-made chain of rocks canal. This is an animation of the operation of a lock. Except for the opening and closing of the gates, the lock operates entirely by the gravity flow of water. Wildlife in the Mississippi River Valley At least 260 species of fish live in the Mississippi River. This represents 25% of all fish species in North America. 40% of the nation's migratory waterfowl use the river corridor, known as the Mississippi Flyway during their spring and fall migration. 60% of all North American birds, 326 species, use the Mississippi River Basin as their migratory flyway. This shows major cities and towns on the lower Mississippi River. This is the metropolitan area population of the largest cities along the Mississippi River. The Mississippi Delta, also known as the Yazoo Mississippi Delta, is the distinctive northwest section of the state of Mississippi, and some portions of Arkansas and Louisiana, which lies between the Mississippi and Yazoo Rivers between Vicksburg and Memphis. This is not to be confused with the delta of the Mississippi River south of New Orleans, where the river enters the Gulf of Mexico. The Mississippi Delta region has been called the most southern bloss on Earth in the sense of epitomizing the region of the American South because of its unique racial, cultural, and economic history. The Mississippi Delta is 200 miles long and 87 miles across at its widest point, encompassing almost 7,000 square miles of alluvial floodplain. It was originally covered in hardwood forest across the bottomlands but was developed as one of the richest cotton-growing areas before the Civil War. The region is part of an alluvial plain, created by regular flooding of the Mississippi and Yazoo rivers over thousands of years. The land is flat and contains some of the most fertile soil in the world. The Mississippi Delta region became one of the richest cotton-growing areas in the nation before the Civil War. The Mississippi Delta attracted many speculators who developed land along the riverfronts for cotton plantations. They became wealthy planters who were dependent on the labor of black slaves, who comprised a vast majority of the population before the Civil War, often being twice the number of whites. The riverfront areas were developed first and railroads were slow to be constructed. 
so most of the bottomlands in the Delta were undeveloped, even after the Civil War. Both black and white migrants flowed into Mississippi, using their labor to clear land and sell timber in order to buy land. By the end of the 19th century, black farmers made up two-thirds of the independent farmers in the Mississippi Delta. In 1890, the white-dominated state legislature passed a new state constitution, effectively disenfranchising most blacks in the state. In the next three decades, most blacks lost their lands due to tight credit and political oppression. African Americans had to resort to tenant farming to survive. Their political exclusion was maintained by the whites until after the gains of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. The majority of residents in several counties in the region are still black. Although more than 400,000 African Americans left the state during the Great Migration in the first half of the 20th century, moving to northern, midwestern, and western industrial cities. The agricultural economy does not support many jobs or businesses, so the economy has needed to diversify. Lumbering is important and new crops such as soybeans have been cultivated in the area by the largest industrial farmers. At times, the region has suffered heavy flooding from the Mississippi River, notably in 1927 and 2011. As the Mississippi River ends its long journey south and enters the Gulf of Mexico, it loses energy and dumps its load of sediment that it has carried through the middle of the continent. The Mississippi River Delta is the seventh largest river delta on Earth. The distance from New Orleans to the Gulf is about 110 miles, or 180 kilometers. This pilet of sediment, or mud has accumulated over the years building up the delta of the river. As one part of the delta became clogged with sediment, the river migrated in search of a new path to the Gulf. Most of the land of the delta consists of mud flats and marshlands. There is little human settlement in this area due to the instability of the sediments. The main shipping channel of the Mississippi River is the broad stripe running northwest to southeast called the Southwest Pass. The modern Mississippi River Delta formed over the last approximately 4,500 years as the Mississippi River deposited sand, clay and silt along its banks and in adjacent basins. New Orleans is on the edge of the continental shelf of North America. Several thousand years ago, the area now known as Louisiana was submerged under the Gulf of Mexico. The Mississippi River over a period of millions of years slowly began depositing silt along the ocean's bottom until eventually land began to break its waves. About one million years ago, the river had built up for itself a fragile delta extending out into the Gulf of Mexico. As the layers upon layers of silt were deposited, the river continued to build up the land in a huge fan-shaped delta extending from Lower Illinois to Louisiana and Mississippi. A new layer of silt was deposited with each successive spring flood, where once the gulf jutted up into the heart of the North American continent. Today the Mississippi juts out 150 miles into the gulf. However, this may change due to efforts to control the river. The head of passes is considered to be the location of the mouth of the Mississippi River. The head of passes is where the main stem of the Mississippi River branches off into three distinct directions at its mouth in the Gulf of Mexico, Southwest Pass, Pass Alutra, East and South Pass Center. They are part of the Bird's Foot Delta, the youngest lobe of the evolving Mississippi River Delta. The modern port of New Orleans began in 1879 with the construction of jetties in South Pass. Sandbars formed in these passes that had hindered ships entering the river ever since the beginning of the city. The jetties narrowed South Pass, forcing the river to cut a deeper channel to a depth of 30 feet, 9 meters. Later, a second channel, Southwest Pass, was deepened to 40 feet, 12 meters, 
by installing jetties. The Southwest Pass is now the main entrance used by seagoing vessel entering and leaving the river. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers maintains a 45-foot shipping channel for 220 miles downriver from Baton Rouge, the farthest inland deep water port of the U.S., to the head of passes, and then downriver a further 20 miles through the Southwest Pass to the Gulf of Mexico. This is the 5.5-mile industrial canal, which links the Mississippi River to Lake Pontchartrain, the Intracoastal Waterway, and the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet. The Mississippi River Gulf Outlet Ship Channel shortened the passage to the Gulf by 40 miles. It was open to maritime traffic in 1963 but has since been closed in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. The Inner Harbor Navigation Canal, IHNC, commonly known as the Industrial Canal provides a navigation channel between the Mississippi River, Lake Pontchartrain, and the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway. It was opened in 1923, and the total length is 5.25 miles. This simplified diagram shows how the southern half of the Industrial Canal also serves as the channel for the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway and the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet Canal, MRGO. Mississippi River Floods The Great Mississippi River Flood in April 1927 was the most destructive river flood and one of the worst natural disasters in the history of the U.S. With 27,000 square miles inundated up to a depth of 30 feet. To try to prevent future floods, the federal government has since built the world's longest system of levees and fluidways. There are now 3,000 miles of levees on the lower Mississippi River. The Mississippi and its swollen tributaries reached peak levels in April of 1927 and overflowed their banks. One by one, Levees built to contain the river broke, and a wall of water pushed its way across Midwestern farmlands. The flood covered 27,000 square miles, an area about the size of Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Vermont combined. For two months the water remained above flood stage, leaving hundreds of thousands of people displaced from their homes. The Mississippi River Flood of 1927 is also called the Great Flood of 1927. Hundreds of thousands of people were displaced, and around 250 died. 94% of the more than 630,000 people affected by the flood lived in the states of Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, mostly in the Mississippi Delta. This map shows the area flooded in the Mississippi River flood of 1927. More than 200,000 African Americans were displaced from their homes along the lower Mississippi River and had to live for lengthy periods in relief camps. As a result of this disruption, many African Americans joined the Great Migration from the South to Northern and Midwestern industrial cities rather than return to rural agricultural labor. This massive population movement increased from World War II until 1970. In the winter of 1926 to 27 there was a record snowfall, with one-third of the U.S. covered. This was followed by several months of heavy rain. This caused all four major rivers, Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio, and Tennessee to swell to unprecedented levels with a 50-foot crest. The first levee broke on April 16, along the Illinois shore. Then, on April 21, the levee at Mounds Landing in Mississippi gave way. Over the next few weeks essentially the entire levee system along the river collapsed. In some places, residential areas were submerged in 30 feet, 9 meters, of water. At least two months passed before the flood water completely subsided. This is the 1927 Flood Museum in Greenville, Mississippi. This is downtown Greenville. On April 30th, 
1927. Six days after the levee break, the flood of 1993 was one of the most devastating floods in U.S. history. More than double the normal amount of rainfall fell in the Midwest during the first half of the year, flooding over 16,000 square miles in nine states. Major flooding was confined to the upper Mississippi due to the less than average level of inflow from lower Mississippi tributaries. Following the Great Flood of 1927, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was charged with control of the Mississippi River. Under the Flood Control Act of 1928, the world's longest system of levees was built. Floodways diverting excessive flow from the Mississippi River were constructed. Most importantly the Atchafalaya Floodway. The Project Design Flood is a hypothetical maximum probable flood of the Mississippi River used by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to aid in the design of flood protection for the Mississippi Valley. While the levees prevented some flooding, the change in the flow of the Mississippi River led to some unintended consequences of increased flooding. This is the old river control structure discharging water into the Atchafalaya in May of 2011. This is the old river control structure complex. The Mississippi River deposits more silt closer to its banks during the spring floods. For that reason, the land is higher closer to the river. As one moves away from the river's edge, the land sinks to about 5 to 10 feet below sea level, but higher in some places. Because the river deposits more silt closer to its banks, the riverbed itself has been built up so much that the river's surface is actually higher than the surrounding land at about 11 feet above sea level. Only the natural levee along its banks is higher than the river's surface. And since the levee is only a foot or two higher than the river's surface, the river is naturally prone to overflow this levee and inundate the lowland around it. Because of this, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers extends the height of the natural levee in an attempt to keep the river within its natural course. Jackson Square is just a few feet above sea level, and the Mississippi River is actually 11 feet higher so that ships appear to be floating hover above the city. Lois is silt-sized sediment formed by the accumulation of wind-blown dust. 10% of the Earth's land area is covered by Lois or similar deposits. Lois is usually homogeneous and highly porous and is traversed by vertical pores that cause the deposits to fracture and form vertical bluffs. The word Lois is related to the English word loose, referring to its nature to crumble easily. Much of the Lois deposits in the U.S. have their origin at the end of the last Great Ice Age, which saw vast deposits of ground-up rock fragments blown by the wind from the upper Midwest into the Mississippi and Missouri valleys. In particular the bluffs that line the east side of the lower Mississippi Valley are composed of lowest deposits several hundred feet high. This is particularly true between Vicksburg and Natchez. It is thought that the reason for the bluffs to be on the east side of the river is that the prevailing winds coming from the west drop much of their load of dust after picking up moisture crossing the wide Mississippi River. It is though that the reason for the bluffs to be on the east side of the river is that the prevailing winds coming from the west drop much of their load of dust after picking up moisture crossing the wide Mississippi River. The geological past of the Lois oils and bluffs contributed greatly to local history and to the outcomes of the Vicksburg campaign. Well before the Civil War, in the early 1800s, Settlers from the east were attracted to the area between Vicksburg and Natchez due to the rich Lois oil on the bluffs. This rich soil and its silt-sized particles allowed for easy access to water for plants and it drained well making it easily ready for plowing and spring planting. These qualities combined allowed for a land prime for growing cotton in fact. The cotton fields of the Lois Hills rival those of the Delta during much of this period typically outproducing them. 
The high lowest bluffs allowed Vicksburg to be a key fortress dominating the sharp bend of the Mississippi River below and controlling travel on the river, as well as providing protection from conquest. During the war, another characteristic of the lowest soil played an important role. The lowest soils of Mississippi tend to remain extremely stable when cut vertically. This changed the terrain of the battle. Trenches were constructed by both the Union and the Confederate soldiers to provide shelter from cannons and artillery. The lowest was stable enough that the Union troops were even able to create tunnels, allowing them to plant explosives under Confederate defenses. During the Siege of Vicksburg, Civilians made impromptu caves in the lowest cliff to seek protection from the bombardment of the siege. Some of these caves were simple one-room structures, while others were multi-roomed and fairly elaborate. While these caves were not true geological caves, they did provide underground shelter from the heavy Union artillery battering the city. Chapter 16 American River and Lake Cruises the two major cruise lines that offer cruises on the Mississippi River are the American Queen Steamboat Company and the American Cruise Lines, soon to be joined in 2023 by Viking Cruise Lines. This is a map showing the ports of call of the American Cruise Lines along the full length of the Mississippi River. These are the ships of the American Cruise Lines that ply the waters of the Mississippi River. This is the map and itinerary of the American Cruise Line's Lower Mississippi River Cruise. This is the map and itinerary of the American Cruise Line's Upper Mississippi River Cruise. These are the ships of the American Queen Steamboat Company that ply the waters of the Mississippi River. This is a map showing the ports of call of the American Queen Steamboat Company along the full length of the Mississippi River. This is the Viking Mississippi of the Viking Cruise Lines that is scheduled to be on the Mississippi River in 2023. It will be a newly built ship that will accommodate 386 passengers. In addition to cruises on the Mississippi River, there are also cruises on other rivers such as the Ohio, Hudson and the Columbia and Snake Rivers. Cruises in the Pacific Northwest on the Columbia and Snake Rivers are offered by both the American Queen Steamboat Company and the American Cruise Lines. This is the 184 guest American song on the Columbia River. There are also small ship cruises on the Great Lakes between Toronto and Chicago. Such as on the 220 passenger Victory 2 of the Victory Cruise Lines. Recommended videos, the Mississippi River. Recommended video, water lock, navigation, animated, one minute, four seconds. Recommended video, why do rivers curve, two minutes, 56 seconds. Recommended video, the Mississippi River facts, five minutes, 44 seconds. Recommended video, Port of South Louisiana, your key to the world. 8 minutes, 4 seconds. For a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.one slash yt navigator. Table of Contents, the Mississippi River. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.